you might get to it anyway, but I, I wanted to just before you before we miss it or miss the opportunity to talk about it, just talk about the tactical phases of flight with the tornado. And you said the, the nav's going to run the intercept, but then I guess once you get to the merge or ahead of the merge, you're going to start taking over things. I, I just wonder what Watch the airplane it. was like to fly BFM or um, you know what what sort of maneuvering capability you had. You've described being limited at 20 degrees and not being able to sort of pull the nose to, to come in and take the shot or get in plane or whatever it is that you're doing. Were you generally um, of a mind to just try and get out of the fight, um, you know, park it behind you and leave the fight or, or could you turn against various other aircraft and did you were there were there were there aircraft you, you definitely didn't want to fight or aircraft that you were actually happy to have a go at yeah and, and really the you know the, the power of the tornado was in the forward quarter so really you didn't want to get into a turning fight and that's actually true for any aircraft you know like even the f-22 or something like that as soon as you start turning and burning you know you're now this great big flare in the air and uh, you know that all they have to do is lob a, a heat-seeking missile in there and, you know, we have this mentality that, you know, there's the last thing you want to do is a blue on blue engagement, you know, so you, you don't want to kill somebody else. So if if your wingman was in the HUD field of view and you're trying to take a, a sidewinder heat seeking shot, uh, that was a big no, no. And I don't think the Soviets would have worried about that. You know, if they if they saw a, a tornado or an F-18 uh, fighting against one of their buddies, they would just lob that missile in and, you know, hope that it hit the right target. Right. So you don't want to, you never want to be in the turning flight, even, even in the F-22. And it, it really is for when you're having a bad day and somebody gets through your long range missile shots. So that's what we did. Um, probably 90% of the time we would practice long range missile engagements. And it was typically against other tornado F3s. So, you know, it was it was not a great training environment to do it against F threes because um, you know we knew exactly what they were going to do. They knew exactly what we were going to do. We both do the same thing at the same time, and then we run back out and come in and do it again. So we, it's like, wow, we're burning a lot of fuel here. And so we did do a couple of deployments over to France, and we did uh, DACT with the Mirage uh, two thousand, and uh, that airplane is a beast. It's um, it's probably like an F-16, but with a bigger wing than the F-16. So you know, we brief up this uh, trip, and then we and then we go out and we set up this uh, long range. Um, I think it was a 44 that we were doing, and um, the NAVs get the uh, contacts, and and we could get quite long range contacts in the tornado, like probably better than most of the teenage fighters, other than maybe the F fourteen or the F fifteen, but certainly better than the sixteen or the eighteen. So we would get a long range contact, and we could get a good sort on them too. So you can tell, you know, how many airplanes there were and in which position or which formation they were flying. So we get we get the uh, long range contact, probably about fifty miles on the Mirage two thousands, and start breaking out the groups. And then I looked down, and there, I can't remember what else to do. They were up at like 40,000 feet at 1.3 Mach. And I thought, we're dead, you know. So we get we get spiked for them, and the the nav was running the, the mission. Uh, he was the guy in my back seat. And uh, I said, we need to get out of here, like right now. And he goes, oh, no, no, there's no bloody way they can, you know, shoot from 30 miles, you know. Come on press in for a sky flash and i said no there's no way that we're ever going to get a sky flash on them and we're going to be dead before i'm even pulling the trigger you know just from the geometry the, the the height and the speed you know they're shooting at 30 miles we're still waiting for 12 miles to shoot them and it would have been a huge pull to even get the nose up to launch off the missile so sure enough they call us all dead you know and, no. <laughs> and the nav is going oh they're cheating there's no way on earth and i said no it's called you know it's called physics old chap <laughs> <laughs> but then we went out for dinner with them and they treated us very well they bought us dinner and lots of good french wine so it was all good <laughs> did you so, yeah. so serious question there did, did you have any confidence in the airplane now, obviously you're going to talk about going to, to oh, combat yeah. and, and maybe that will come into into play there but but as a as a, a platform as an intercept platform then uh, and what, what, yeah, what are you yeah. describing there? You're describing a misunderstanding of, of tactics, or you're describing uh, uh, some li the limitations of the airframe. So it, it can see the the target yeah. that far yeah. out, fantastic. But that's yeah. no good if you can't do anything with it. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. So, so this is, and and it gets back to doing a similar training, you know? So when you're, when you're flying tornado V tornado, you're both limited by the limitations of the airplane and the weapon. So it was the, the very short range of the uh, sky flash and they should have fixed that. I, I don't know what it was. It was maybe because they designed the, the airframe around the sky flash. Maybe they couldn't have put a bigger, a bigger uh, rocket motor on it. Okay. But, um, and then they, they, they did eventually get the AMRAP just after I left actually. So getting back to your question, um, it was both the, the limitations in the aircraft and the weapon and not adapting the tactics to a dissimilar adversary. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was readily obvious, you know, the first time we did it. I was going to say, you should have been able to get up to that, that height and that speed easily in the F3. I mean, that's... It's a no, 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 no. It was, it, it's possible to get up there, but it, it's it's a full-time job to get up there. Is it yeah. really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because okay. the, the wings are so small. Like, even, even with the wings uh, swept fully forward um, and the weight of the aircraft it's very heavy you know and, and one of the things is the wing sweep mechanism so you know they had to put a lot of extra iron mongery in it to to make it work mm. and you know that whole wing sweep idea was just ridiculous it was you know and and, and so many air forces bought onto it too you know the americans and the soviets with the mig-23 and it's like this is really stupid you know it was a really dumb idea actually wow you could go very fast uh, but in the tornado you had to be down low you know to, to get a high uh, indicated airspeed so, so and it would do Mach 2, but that to, to get a Mach 2 run in, and I tried to do that on my very last trip in the Tornado, I wanted to get the Mach 2 badge, and I got up to, I think, 1.86, and we just ran out of airspace and almost ran out of fuel. I mean, you're in you're in full reheat the whole time, you know, to, to climb up, to accelerate, and to maintain supersonic. So. Wow. So yeah, there was there was some there were some significant uh, limitations, but um, I'll I'll try and stress the positive part. So the the radar was very powerful. We would get long range acquisition on the radar, and because the beam width was very small, so getting into the the technicality part, the beam width is a function of the size of the radar antenna. So the bigger the antenna, the smaller the beam width because it focuses the uh, the radiation going out. And the smaller the beam width, the better you can uh, sort the target. So you can pick out two aircraft flying in, in reasonably close formation and see that it's two and not just one blip. So that was a big advantage over the Hornet because the Hornet had a fairly large uh, beam width. And you would you would see the contact at a, at a reasonable range. But to pick out the, the actual formation and then sort onto the guy that you were responsible for, that was very difficult in the Hornet in the first generation radar that we had. Mm-hmm. So that was a big um, advantage. The other thing about the F3 was it had an uh, IFF, so the identification friend or foe. So if you were squawking, including the secure squawk mode four, you know, you could interrogate the other aircraft. So that was typically one layer of the threat matrix to decide if this was a hostile aircraft or, you know, a potentially friendly aircraft or, you know, just a, um, a non-combatant type of thing. Um, so that was good. And, and you could see that on the display behind you as well. So, um, we didn't have data link at the time, but if the, tar- the targets were squawking, then you could see their squawk behind you. So you had an idea of when they were turning cold sort of thing. So there were some great things about it. The other great thing about the uh, tornado was an excellent radar warning receiver, far, far better than the F-18 had. So it was uh, very accurate. Um, and it would show all kinds of interesting things, um, such as the AWACS. So you could actually see the um, AWACS, even though it wasn't locked on us, you could you know, you know, could see that it was uh, eliminating us. Wow. And we used that in um, the Cope Thunder exercise that we did in Alaska. So I'll get onto that a bit later um, and remind me if I, if I forget. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so, um, so we did lots of deployments. Um, on 29 squadron out of Coningsby. Uh, Akrotiri was probably one of the favorite. Uh, several uh, dissim- dissimilar air combat uh, over in Europe. Um, we would fly, I think we went down to Yeovilton and flew against the uh, Sea Harriers. Um, uh, we would support the mud movers, so the GR1s, the Jaguars, that sort of thing in the UK, either escorting them or opposing them. And um, 
so there was there was a great variety, even though it was air to you know air to air only. There's no air to surface work, but uh, a great variety of um, exercises and, and training that we did. Yeah.